Now it's on foot from here. Okay, Zach. Take a look. Which way? I'm I think when the lay in Billy. We do what or make a tower. What now? What's his problem now? He says we can't go on. He's, these woods are protected. Oh yeah? Protected by who? I'm I think when the lay in Billy. We do what or make a tower. By a ghost. A what? A ghost who walks. Got it. Mr. Drax is going to be very happy. He's on a quest for a supernatural power. You were right, Mr. Drax. Yes. They know far too much. Have you any idea what it means if the Brotherhood gets control of the skulls? Invincible. And stop them. What the hell is that? Shoot him! Oh, shit! Who was that guy? Somebody I already killed. What? You heard me. The summer of 1996, The Phantom hit our screens. Based on the Lee Falk comic strip, the movie was produced on an estimated budget of around $45 million and only managed to make back $17 million in the United States and I'm not sure how it did worldwide, but unfortunately it was a disappointment for Paramount Studios. But thankfully it was very popular once it came to VHS and Laserdisc and eventually when it hit DVD. The Phantom came out in 1936, two years before Superman. He has no superpowers and has to rely on his strength, intelligence and his fearsome reputation of being an immortal ghost. He became very popular worldwide at the time and even got his own serial consisting of 15 episodes in 1943 with Tom Tyler as the Phantom. Each episode had a cliffhanger style ending. In 1955 they attempted a new series with John Hart in the lead role. While into production the rights had expired so they had to change the title from Return of the Phantom to The Adventures of Captain Africa. They had to amend the costume and re-edit and reshoot many scenes. When it came to the movie's release in 1996, Billy Zane felt the studio failed to market the movie properly. As a kid I saw the usual adverts for it in comics, but it didn't turn up at my local cinema. For me, I only knew of the Phantom from the Defenders of the Earth cartoon, and there were a couple of toys produced. Also, I saw a few episodes of the Phantom 2040 cartoon that was loosely based on the original comics, and it was met with rave reviews when it was first broadcast in 1994 and run for 35 episodes. I think the majority of kids and teenagers may have not been aware of the character and probably decided to give it a miss at the time, or Paramount failed to get their attention. The trailer is just your standard mid-90s style of advertising. Cheesy voiceover and includes the Joe Goldsmith Judge Dredd theme that was going to be part of a Stallone film. This music was often used in the mid to late 90s for trailers such as Lost in Space. Director Joe Dante had been originally attached to direct The Phantom. He had started developing the film during the early 90s for Paramount. Scriptwriter Jeffrey Boehm, who was famous for his work on Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, had been on the project when Joe jumped on board. Bruce Campbell, the B-movie legend, was originally going to play the Phantom and had screen tested for the role. I'm not sure if he had tested for the role when Australian director Simon Winsor became attached to the project, but he lost out to Billy Zane. Paramount Studios decided to push back the production which made it difficult for Joe Dante, so he decided to bow out down to other commitments, but stayed on as an executive producer. Simon Winsor had been directing TV shows since the 70s and had provided his talents on the epic miniseries Lonesome Dove and the young Indiana Jones TV series. He is a great director when it comes to producing family friendly movies such as Daryl and Free Willy, so tackling a film like The Phantom which is trying to capture that old school style of adventure serials and movie making is a perfect match. Filming began in October of 1995 and finished in February of 96, so not a long shoot and the director of photography David Burr had revealed it was quite a relaxed production with little to no studio interference. Thailand was used as the Phantom's fictional home country, Bangala, and the incredible action scene involving the collapsing bridge was filmed there, and also the Phantom's skull cave and the local town. 
In Australia, they set up shop at the Warner Roadshow Movie World studio, filming on three sound stages, one for the Pirate's Cave and the fight scene at the end, and the New York offices of Xander Drax. The Brisbane City Hall was used for the museum sequence. The production designer Paul Peters made great efforts to make it resemble a New York museum. The creator of the comics, Lee Falk, then in his 80s, visited the set when they were filming in Australia, and he was very impressed with the direction and style the movie was going with. Billy Zane plays the hero, the Phantom. Billy got into great shape for the role, training every day and between takes. They had originally designed a moulded rubber suit very much like Batman's and The Flash, but Billy had no need for it. He was pretty buff when it came to testing out the outfit. The costume was designed by the Jim Henson Creature Shop, and the trademark striped underpants, I believe, were dropped during tests at the time, which was a good thing, because I don't think it would have worked at all. The film opens with, for those who came in late, these words Lee Falk would introduce to readers both old and new to the legend of the Phantom. 400 years ago, a young boy witnesses the murder of his father during an attack on their ship by the ruthless Sang Brotherhood. He is washed ashore on the Bengala Island and found by tribesmen who take him to their village. There he is given the Skull Ring and swears to devote his life to the destruction of piracy, greed, cruelty and injustice. In adulthood, he adopts the identity of the Phantom, a masked Avenger. 1938, in the Bengala jungle, the 21st Phantom finds the man who killed his own father by a mercenary named Quill. His father at the beginning narrates the backstory and also appears to his son throughout the film. The role of the Phantom is passed on from father to son through generations, causing people to mistakenly believe in a single immortal figure, earning him the nickname The Ghost Who Walks. His team are searching for the Three Skulls of Chaganda, possession of which grants the owner tremendous power. The Phantom saves a native boy the team had kidnapped to use as a guide from the mercenary's truck as it dangles off the side of a bridge. However, Quill, revealed as a member of the Seng Brotherhood, manages to escape with a skull and returns to the United States of America to seek his reward from Drax. In New York City, Kit's old school friend Diane Palmer, played by Kirsty Swanson, who many may know as the Buffy the Vampire Slayer from the movie, is sent by her uncle David Palmer, the owner of the Tribune newspaper, to Bengala in order to investigate rumours that Xander Drax, a power-mad New York businessman and Quill's boss, is profiting from piracy. En route, Diane's seaplane is hijacked by Drax's female air pirates, led by the mysterious and seductive Sala. They kidnap Diane and take her to their base in Bengala. The Phantom, told of the kidnapping by Captain Philip Horton of the Jungle Patrol, heads out to rescue Diane and bumps into Quill, who still believes it's the original Phantom, trying to pinpoint the wound he inflicted. Phantom and Diane escape in a biplane and narrowly avoid getting killed, as the plane is leaking fuel. They head back to his headquarters, the Skull Cave, with the help of his white horse, Hero, and his pet wolf, Devil. Diane meets Captain Horton, and is warned by the Phantom and Horton that she is mixed up with the Sengai Brotherhood. In an attempt to protect Diane, the Phantom tells Horton to return her to New York while he goes after the Brotherhood. Diane attempts to argue about being sent home, but the Phantom disappears deep into the Skull Cave, with the Captain telling Diane that no one argues with the Phantom and wins. The Phantom then travels to New York as Kit Walker to meet with Dave Palmer, and is reunited with Diane, who is unaware of his alter ego, but he struggles to hold back from doing his Phantom poses. With the help of information from Diane's friend Jimmy Wells, they locate the second skull in the Museum of National History. Outside the museum, it has the date 1939, either implying it's a year after the events in the jungle, or a mix-up with the dates. Drax, however, is already en route, and gets the skull of Kit, just as he discovers it, capturing them and stealing the second skull, uniting it with the first. The pair of skulls reveal the location of the third skull, on an uncharted island in the Yellow Sea, known as the Devil's Vortex. Kit manages to escape from Quill and his henchmen, and changes into the Phantom. He escapes down an elevator shaft using his two guns for grips. He narrowly avoids getting crushed by the lift, and exits Drax's building, evading the chasing police. Drax kidnaps Diane, calling it Phantom Insurance, after it's revealed he may have a soft spot for her. And meanwhile, Sala flies Drax, Quill and Diane to the Devil's Vortex, unaware the Phantom is hanging on the side of the plane. The Phantom does have a lot of practical stunts which are executed to a very high standard and staged very well, especially the opening action sequence and the escape from the plane. If you look closely though, you can see the support cables holding the stuntman just in case he falls as he attempts to escape the cockpit being produced in the digital age. Digital compositing was common, there is no traditional optical effects. The effects were handled by the Buena Vista effects group, 
which used its own software called CAPS. It was a proprietary paint animation compositing system. A perfect example of it in action is the Drax building. The first floor is real and the rest is created digitally. Many of the digital compositing shots still look good today, which I was very surprised by, especially in HD. There is great depth to the image and no loss of colour, or shifts in resolution when it cuts back and forth between live action and the visual effects shots. They did shoot a lot of the background plates in the VistaVision format, just to help give the background shots more detail. The DP David Burr had said he would reshoot the biplane cockpit scenes against green screen instead of rear projection. The American composer David Newman provides the score. David is a very talented composer and has provided many great scores to many films such as Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Galaxy Quest and Ice Age. A lot of his scores are to family friendly movies and comedies. The music to Phantom is a great callback to the classic adventure serials of the past, full of action cues and he provides some great atmosphere to the opening sequence in the jungle. He provides the Phantom with an interesting theme tune. It's not something you can hum or remember as easily as Superman, but it definitely serves its purpose well. The music is performed by the London Metropolitan Orchestra. His work was released at the time on CD, but only 40 minutes of music was available. Thankfully, La La Land Records recently released a limited edition CD, featuring the complete score containing 30 minutes of unreleased music. It's still available to purchase and a must own. The Phantom to me gets better with repeated viewing. It ages like a fine wine. As a teenager I thought it was okay, nothing special, then I picked it up on Laserdisc and found it more enjoyable, and finally seeing it on Blu-ray you can really take in the fantastic visuals. The movie definitely excels when it comes to the comedy, which is not forced, but a big part of the play between the characters. It just has a great sense of fun about it. Billy Zane I feel is perfectly cast as the Phantom. He has a great charm to his personality and plays him like a proper hero. He is just a good guy, very much like how Christopher Reeve played Superman. His alter ego, Kit, is a little weak to be honest. I think Billy has such a distinctive face it wouldn't be difficult to spot the Phantom on his day off. And also there isn't a change in his voice or mannerisms. In the film they do play that up though, like he is not good at hiding his real identity, because he does his Phantom poses by mistake. The idea of a man in a purple suit running around the jungle is a totally silly idea, and is the worst kind of camouflage but the movie acts like it doesn't care and it plays it straight and if you can accept that, you can enjoy it for what it is. The ideas of translating comics to the big screen is always difficult. What may work in the comics doesn't necessarily work in the real world. And of course the ideas behind the Phantom are silly in a realistic sense, but it's a comic book movie. If you can't accept that, then you will certainly find it all very ridiculous. Setting it in the 30s was the right approach. I think they would have struggled to set it in modern times. There was a miniseries produced in 2009, which aired on the Sci-Fi Channel, which tried to modernise the Phantom. Checking reviews online, it seemed to get mixed feedback. I think it was intended for a longer run, but nothing panned out. It probably upset more of the hardcore fans who weren't happy with the update and changes made. Some loved the look of it, but some felt it was like a cheap TV movie. With having the feature film set in the past, it faced the same fate as The Rocketeer and The Shadow. I'm not sure why having a movie set in that period often results in poor box office. The reviews for these movies were all pretty good at the time. It may be down to the audiences finding it difficult to relate to the periods they are set in, or the studios struggle to find what age range to market these films at. If you had to compare the three films, I would say The Shadow is the weakest out of the bunch for me. It lacks any real exciting action. The Rocketeer is probably the strongest out of the three when it comes to its story. It definitely has more interesting characters and the whole plot is more rewarding and enjoyable. The Phantom definitely wins at providing the goods when it comes to the action set pieces, and the Phantom himself acts like a proper hero. Unlike the Rocketeer where he is reluctant to be a hero to take on the bad guys, he sort of accidentally falls into that role. The movie does have its problems which are very obvious. The backstory is wafer thin and feels evidently rushed. It wants to get straight into it. It may be down to studio pressure to keep the running time at a suitable length, but I feel it's hard for an audience to be invested in a character if things like backstory aren't given time to breathe. Things are certainly glossed over which I think for big fans of the comics would ultimately be disappointed with. But you could argue that comics often brush over the backstory especially if you read the early Batman Superman comics, but when it comes to a movie you do have to go into detail to flesh out the characters. 
the relationship between Kit and Diana feels forced and doesn't seem like a natural progression. There is certainly chemistry between the actors, which helps the film get away with it, but there needed to be more time with them to see that relationship blossom. There are reports of deleted scenes featuring more of Kit and Diana, but the cinematographer believes everything shot between those two was left in the film. So it's definitely an issue with the script that needed more meat to it. Catherine Zeta-Jones' character seems very underwritten. She just seems obsessed with trying to get with the Phantom and changes sides near the end and becomes one of the good guys very quickly. She obviously sees the errors of her ways and realises she is working for the wrong team, but you don't really care about her decision to change and you just end up being surprised by the end because it kind of comes out of nowhere. When the Phantom takes his mask off, the eye makeup disappears, very much like in Batman Returns, but thankfully they chose not to shoot Billy with the mask on and no eye makeup. They just cut to him removing the mask and the eye makeup is gone. Yeah, it's a continuity error, but you can't have the actor with these huge panda eyes. It would look daft. James Reamer, the guys put in some great performances in his time, like the Warriors and the TV show Dexter, but in this he is very cheesy. He is not wooden, but he is overacting some scenes and downplaying others where it needed more emotion and drama to his delivery. It feels like he's acting in a pantomime. You could argue that Treat Williams, as Drax, acts over the top as well, but he's consistent throughout the movie. The best humour in the film comes from his performance. He is clearly self-aware that it's a comic book movie. He is a total madman and psycho in it, but instantly lovable. There is a lot to enjoy from this film. The action set pieces are staged very well and are exciting. The visuals especially are terrific. Roger Ebert gave the film three and a half stars out of four, praising its visual design. Paul Peters' art direction is inspired. I love the look of Drax's offices and the Phantom's cave. David Berg creates a beautiful colour palette to the movie. With the help of the great set design, he manages to transport you back to the 30s. All the actors for the most part put in great performances. The music, as I mentioned earlier, is a joy to listen to. You can hear it in full swing during my opening trailer to the review. It works so well. The movie is harmless fun and shouldn't be taken too seriously. Just sit back and have fun with it. It doesn't try to be super serious and dark. Its strengths lie with its homage to the action serials of the 30s and 40s, very much like the Indiana Jones series, and above all, captures the old comics. It's a comic book movie after all. Treat it like one. This is it. This is what I'm looking for. The skulls of Taganda. One made of gold, one made of silver, one made of jade. Are they valuable? One in that garage the dangerous. This and this. When placed together, the three skulls harness an energy a thousand times greater than any force or high explosive known to man. It's the bottom of the ninth, and you're uh, two skulls behind. Dad, a man named Quill has a gun belt just like the one I wear. Is it yours? Yeah. He said he could show me the stronghold of the Seven Brotherhood, and he took me to a place deep in the jungle. What happened? He stabbed me in the back. All right, gentlemen, nobody... Ladies, kindly pardon my error. Don't move! What is this, a ship full of women? So close now. I can feel it. Goes to walks. I'll cut you off it. <laughs> Immortal. Ah! Those who killed my father. 